A cold arctic breeze stung the tips of my ears as I stood in formation with the other members of the President's Honor Guard at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Fifty state flags rippled above our heads. I gripped the pole supporting the Wyoming state flag with my gloved hand. Another day, another ceremony. I swallowed the yawn forming in the back of my throat and stared at a place far beyond the heads of the assembled guests and reporters. As the Prime Minister of Australia looked on, President Reagan expounded upon America's friendship with the land down under and the future of our countries in the world market. My thoughts switched to my own uncertain future. Earlier that day, the Guard Commander had spoken to me about signing up for another tour of duty. I knew I couldn't stay in the Honor Guard forever. Was it time for me to move on? If so, to where? To do what? What should I do with the rest of my life? I wondered. I thought about the people who had shown an interest in my future. My grandmother settles prophecy that I'd be a preacher. Commissioner Schwab's prediction that I'd be a member of Portland City Council by the time I reached 30. And old Mr. Johnston. I remembered how frightened I was the day I reported to the Military Processing Center in downtown Portland. Mr. Johnston met me at the door. He handed me the forms I needed to fill out. They gave me a strange look. Later, I learned that he'd been handing out processing forms at the center for 40 years. I also learned that the 300 or so recruits being processed that day for the five branches of the military would be the last group to go through the center at that location. It was being moved to a new million-dollar facility. At the door to the room where we'd been be given our physical exams, Mr. Johnston met me again, and again he handed me a form and gave me a strange look, quizzical look. Great, I thought. I'm not even in the Air Force yet, and they don't like me. As I started to enter the room, Mr. Johnston spoke to me. At the end of the day, I'd like to speak with you, son. Make sure you're alone. My eyes narrowed as I studied the craggy old face. Maybe they're going to throw me out before I even enter. Maybe they found my school records, and I could only imagine. As I inched through the induction process, my mind raced. Why in the world would they want me anyway? Maybe I should just turn around and go home. When the eight-hour induction process ended, I thought, maybe he forgot about me. But no such luck. Before I could make good my escape, Mr. Johnston spotted me and waved me into his office. Once inside, he said, I've been working this job for many years, and I've processed thousands of guys. I've gotten to the point where I can tell the good guys from the bad ones. I can tell that you're one of the good ones, and I have this strange feeling that you're going to rise in the military. Surprised, I managed to mumble a thank you. Whatever you're doing with your life, keep it up, he added. Stumbling around for a reply, I said, I've just recently become a Christian. He cast a wry smile. I'm not a religious person myself, but I get good vibes from you. When you come home on leave, drop by and let me know what you're doing to see if my hunch is right. I mumbled a pro promise to do as he asked and shook his hand. Outside the building, I shook my head and thought, that's strange. I joined the Air Force in order to make attending college a possibility, not to make it my life's career. In Academy, my fellow classmates had discussed their exciting dreams and goals and where they could put their talents to best use. But me? What talents did I have? Goals? I barely planned beyond eating lunch at McDonald's with my buddies. I certainly didn't have any compelling dreams on which to focus. Matter of fact, 
I couldn't see any real future for myself. What could I contribute to society? My desire to excel and my lack of direction caused my friendships to seesaw between those students who were motivated and those just drifting. More often, I found myself with the drifting crowd. My joining the Air Force had been the result of a coin toss. I would go to college with the motivated kids or enlist in the military with a couple buddies. Later, my buddies changed their minds, leaving me alone, a lone inductee in the United States Air Force. While my experiences in flight training in the police academy proved to be challenging, my experience in the Honor Guard supplied a positive foundation upon which I could build my future. But as I stood on the White House lawn that frigid December afternoon, I considered my options and thought about the advice I'd received from others. I still didn't know what Terry Johnson wanted for Terry Johnson. A part of me wanted to remain secure with the success I'd had. Another part of me yearned to see beyond the military. I recalled a recent phone call I'd made to Grandma Settles. I told her of my perplexities. Terry, she said, I'm ashamed of you. You've let the devil get a hold of your dreams and confuse you. Leave it to my grandmother to hit the nail on the head. Maybe so, Grandma. So how do I change that? You need to ask God to help you dream again. Is that it? My logical mind looked askance at my loved one's simplistic advice. No, not quite. After you pray, imagine that the President of the United States comes up to you and asks, What do you want to do with your life? I'm here to help and support you in any way I can. Then he adds, Don't dream small dreams. Dream something big, something you really want to do. That's my grandma, I laughed to myself. Her dreams are never small. The grandma added, Now, instead of the President of the United States, picture the King of the Universe saying the same thing and promising to help you reach your God-given goals by supplying you with everything you could possibly need. I thanked her, then hung up. My intellect scoffed. Too easy. Yet Grandma had been right about so many things over the years. As I stood in formation that blustery day on the balcony of the White House portico, I mentally listed all the possibilities I'd considered over the years. I narrowed my dreams down to three possibilities. To be a preacher, stay with the military, or become a politician. I'd received several offers from major players on the Washington, D.C. scene, promising that if I were interested, they would set me up with scholarships and start my life in politics. My superiors in the Honor Guard encouraged me to make a career out of the military. With your record, you can go anywhere you want to in, in the service, Johnson. General Colin Powell called another guardsman and me aside in the cafeteria. He told us that for an African-American to rise in the military, a college education would be helpful. Get your degree. You'll need it if you plan to make it in the military or even make the military your career. Pastor friends urged me to study for the ministry. Not only would I be helping people, they said, but I'd be sharing God's word as well. I knew I wanted to help people in a special way. I enjoyed working with teenagers. I could see that college would be the next step, regardless of my career choice. But most important, I knew that satisfaction and happiness comes from being exactly where God wants you to be. Now you might say, what's the big quandary here? God is going to lead you to become a minister. That's his business. No, that's not necessarily true. Not everyone is cut out to be a preacher or a doctor or a garage mechanic. Inherited talents and interests 
are ours for a purpose, God's purpose. God uses people in different positions to glorify him, not just in positions connected directly with church work. One service is no less important than another if you are where God wants you to be. I recall talking with my grandma about dreams and finding one's future. Her advice was, test your dreams. Test my dreams, Grandma? How? She smiled. There are three tests I use. First, will my dream help other people? Second, does my dream fit into harmony with God's plan? And third, when God blesses me as I carry out that dream, will I give him the credit? If you can answer yes to all these questions, you're on your way. Even the impossible dreams? I asked, partially teasing. Dreams that seem impossible are not impossible with God, she replied. My mother has become a terrific example of reaching for impossible dreams. Mother always wanted to be an inspirational speaker. People kept telling her that such a dream was impossible because of her Southern Creole accent. At 61, after six children and eight grandchildren, she gave her dream to God. Today, she travels across the United States, sharing the story of God's goodness in her life. Her heavy speaking itinerary would put a traveling evangelist to shame. Recently, both of our names were on the list to speak at a graduation exercise. The committee chose her over me and over 12 of their candidates. But that day on the White House lawn, while well, I had the clue how I should dream, it was clear that college should be my next move. An inner voice nagged at my decision. Terry, you can't. You're too... I shut off the negative re recordings. Right after that, I began putting my plans into motion. I made arrangements with my commander to be released early in order to help with an inner city program in the months before I headed for college in the fall. I would stay in the guard until after the Bush inauguration. Incoming Jeeps handled the inaugurations, inauguration proceedings because the old timers preferred to cover the farewell for the outgoing president, their last chance to serve their commander in chief. President Reagan had become particularly pro-military during his terms in office. So it was a special honor for the five branches of the service to attend his farewell ceremony. Having secured the status of sergeant months previously, I was appointed NCO in charge of the event. It was my job to be certain that government dignitaries and their spouses, military brass and their spouses, foreign ambassadors, cabinet members, members of the Air Force Band and members of the press, more than 600 people were directed to their correct reserved seats inside a gigantic aircraft hangar. Surrounding the seating area in United States Air Force One in a president's helicopter, as well as a sample of each of the planes and helicopters approved during the Reagan administration were parked. The Coast Guard displayed samples of their newest drug fighting boats. The press box on the far side of the dais concerned me the most. I stood at the end of the front line closets, front line closest to the dais, so I could keep an eye on the press box. I didn't want any eager beaver photojournalists trying to stretch the perimeters of the privilege. Chills ran the length of my spine when the Air Force Band struck the first chords of Hail to the Chief. Just as President Reagan started down the corridor of honor cards, a photographer distracted me for a moment. By the time I returned, my attention to the president, he was less than three feet away from me. Instinctively, I snapped off a salute. To my surprise and the delight of the audience, President Reagan returned my salute. The crowd erupted into cheers and applause at the commander-in-chief's unplanned gesture. Reagan continued his walk to the dais to the standing ovation of the crowd. 
He raised his hand to silence their applause. Tears brimmed in the retiring president's eyes as he spoke of his years as commander-in-chief. Before he left the hangar, he turned to the gathering assembly and shouted, I'm proud of you all. Later alone in my room, I looked back over my years in the White House honor card. In less than four years, I met more heads of state than had any member of Congress. I never dreamed God would take me so far in so little time. Grandma Settles was right. My dreams had been too small. On the day of George Bush's inauguration, a biting January wind whipped through the swearing in arena area. My staff and I had been making last minute adjust adjustments since 4 a.m. I scanned the scene, knowing that in a very short time the procession would arrive and George Bush would be sworn in as President of the United States. I started in surprise at the sudden sound of laughing and talking. Children rambled out onto the platform. The Bush's grandkids had arrived. Then the president to be came onto the platform. He took time to bend down and listen to a younger grandchild. Mrs. Bush helped round them all up, even patting down a cowlick on one of the boys. Family and neighbors of the Bushes gathered side by side with U.S. Senators and several of the nation's religious leaders, Robert Schuller, Billy Graham, and Norman Vincent Peale. I told my friend, Sergeant Griffey, how impressed I was with the family atmosphere. Like the Carter inauguration, he confided. President Reagan's inauguration was more high class. I studied the face of the president's mother. It shone with pride and determination. I thought of my own mother back in Oregon and the determination she had for the kid who couldn't read. I felt as though I would burst my buttons with gratitude that day. When Reagan turned over the presidency to Bush, I felt akin to him. Leaving the honor guard was proving to be much more difficult than I had imagined. I listened as the new president said, the new breeze blows, the page turns, the story unfolds, and so today a chapter begins. For me also, a new chapter would begin. I would face my demons head on. I would go back to school. <laughs>